Okay, today let us uh, begin the study of the next uh, in the sequence of partial differential equations of physics. This is the Hemmholtz equation and the equation itself is fairly simple. which is of the form del squared plus k squared the inhomogeneous Hemmholtz equation is something like del squared plus k squared of on f equal to some given function of g. Okay. The you will recognize the homogeneous version of this as describing the normal no modes of a region. So if for instance your uh, position vector r is an element of uh, some, some region r then this equation del squared plus k squared on u equal to 0 in this region for r in this region is a homogeneous uh, Hemmholtz equation and it describes the normal modes of vibration if you like of this region r provided you sol satisfy certain boundary conditions, suitable boundary conditions have to be specified. The most common one would be uh, this is for r element of this region and u equal to 0 on the boundaries of r. These are called directly boundary conditions. For instance, if you have a two dimensional membrane like a drum head and then you clamp the drum head at the edges of the drum that corresponds to saying the displacement u is 0 at the end ends of this boundary at the boundary of this region and then you ask what are the normal modes of vibration namely what are the possible values of this quantity k squared. So, it is like an eigenvalue equation as you can see all you are doing is solving del squared u equal to minus k squared u. So, this is an eigenvalue equation and the allowed values of k squared would correspond to the normal modes of the system hmm? whatever be the dimensionality of this region. Now, of course, you are familiar with this problem in the problem of the vibrating string the standing waves on a string clamped at both ends is precisely of this kind or the normal modes of a drum head which is clamped at the edges is of this kind and so on. That is one class of problems. My immediate purpose here is not to look at that, that is a well studied class of problems, but rather to try to find the particular integral for this equation here, the inhomogeneous equation. More specifically, I would like to find the green function for del squared plus k squared, the fundamental green function for del squared plus k squared satisfying the boundary condition that the green function vanishes at spatial infinity. So, this is in the same spirit as the green function we already found for the Laplacian operator, the diffusion equation and so on. So, that is our problem and to sort of give it a physical setting, let us do this in the context of uh, an application which is the quantum mechanical theory of scattering the simplest scattering theory in quantum mechanics, non-relativistic particle scattering of a static potential. Okay. So, let us uh, change uh, get into get into this a little bit, describe this problem a bit and I will explain where the green function comes in. So, we are going to look at non-relativistic scattering. it is the scattering of a quantum mechanical particle from some fixed static potential okay. and non-relativistic because we are going to avoid the complications that arise when the particle moves at relativistic speeds, speeds comparable to the speed of light. So, we will use the non-relativistic approximation. It is a static potential, does not change with time and the problem we are looking at is time independent in the sense that we have a scatter, we would like to know what happens when I shoot a steady stream of particles at such a potential and ask what happens to the scattering in various angles. Okay. So, the uh, just to put this in context, if you have a scattering center here and we will assume that this particle has a mass m and it sees or moves under the influence of a central potential about some origin which I denote by V of R. So, there is a potential V of R and this is a central potential. Okay. 
in other words it is not a function of the angular coordinates, but only of the radial distance from this center of attraction or repulsion as the case may be. And then the question is when I shoot a particle of a given energy at it what happens to it. Okay. Now classically of course you are very familiar with this kind of problem. For instance if you shoot a beam of particles collimated beam of particles of a given initial energy kinetic energy then these particles would in general come and scatter off this potential and you can compute from this uh, potential by using classical mechanics you can compute how many of particles from the incident beam would go in a particular direction okay, etc. You can find everything you know about it and you are familiar already with this uh, famous problem the Kepler problem where if this potential is a 1 over r potential then the scattered particle moves in an elliptic orbit these are the open orbits for uh, an, uh, Kepler problem the 1 over r potential and the formula that gives you the scattering cross section in different directions is called the Rutherford formula. formula. This is the famous problem of uh, scattering of alpha particles from the nucleus uh, the classical approximation. Quantum mechanically this is a slightly different problem because as you know in quantum mechanics particles do not have definite trajectories because of the uncertainty principle. So, what you have to do is to specify some initial wave function or initial state of the particle and then ask what happens to this after the scattering occurs. Okay. So, we are going to look at the stationary states of the problem in other words energy eigenvalues in which I prescribe the value of the energy. So, we will look at in contrast to the problem of bound states for instance if you have a positive uh, uh, if you have a positive charge positively charged nucleus and then you have the hydrogen atom problem this gives you a set of discrete energy levels corresponding to the bound states of the hydrogen atom. But you could also ask what happens if I scatter an electron off a proton using this coulomb potential. This thing is again as you know describable by a wave function, but in this case the wave function is not normalizable it is a plane wave state to start with and it goes off as emptotically as another plane wave state. So, we have a picture where you have instead of this you have a scattering center a spherically symmetrical potential and the incident state has to be specified for me ok. That would correspond classically to a set of a beam of particles coming in with a fixed momentum linear momentum constant linear momentum. Now, what would that correspond to in the quantum mechanical language? they would be plane wave states ok. Now, just to fix things let us call this the direction of the incident wave vector or momentum ok and let us call this k this vector. I will later on use polar coordinates where we choose this as the polar axis the direction of the z coordinate and then about this I will use spherical polar coordinates. Okay. Now, the incident state consists of a set of plane waves these are planes constant phase uh, surfaces are plane waves and therefore, let me write psi incident of r equal to a plane wave state with a fixed value of the wave vector. Huh? So, it is equal to e to the power i k dot r times some normalization constant here, but I cannot make this a square integrable function because this thing here diverges, but it is some plane wave state multiplied by some constant and let me put that constant equal to unity because as you will see shortly this constant will get cancelled out. Okay. Now, that plane wave comes in and then it scatters off this potential and goes off in all directions because diffraction occurs if you like and scattering occurs. So, what will go out are spherical waves these are spheres the surfaces of constant phase are spheres now emanating from this scattering center and that would be your psi scattered of r and by the superposition principle the wave function at any particular point would be a superposition of the incident wave and the scattered state. So, the psi total the total wave function psi of r equal to psi incident plus psi scattered. we are going to try to compute what this psi scattered of r is ok. Now, of course, you need to know what its form is going to be I already assumed that very far away from the scattering center 
in the classical case, what I would do is to put detectors everywhere. I would put a little detector here in at all angles and calculate what is the fraction of the flux of the incident particles that falls into the detector at various solid angles. That gives me information about how the scattering potential acts on these particles. Okay. In the same way, I would put detectors at various points and ask for unit incident flux, what fraction of it gets scattered into a particular direction here, some given direction, some solid angle. Okay. In spherical polar coordinates, I would ask what is the scattered flux into a little cone of solid angle d omega. This is the question I would ask and the assumption is that you are going to be able to put detectors wherever you like and discover what is the scattered flux through this direction. This is the problem. Yeah. Scattered waves are spherical without really considering any of the what the potential is or any. Uh, I've assumed yes, I've assumed that this is a spherically symmetrical potential. Okay, this is crucial. Okay, then I look asymptotically and ask what happens to this particle. Think of it classically. If it's elastic scattering, then what's going to happen is that the initial momentum is going to change direction but not magnitude. Okay, so let's say that the initial or incident energy E is h cross squared k squared over 2 m. h cross k is in fact the initial momentum uh, and h cross squared k squared over 2 m is just p squared over 2 m. This is the incident energy. Now, if it is elastic scattering, then all that happens is that an incident particle in this with this momentum k gets scattered in some arbitrary direction theta phi in polar coordinates say and this is k prime such that the energy in the final state is the same as the energy in the initial state. Mm. So, this is also equal to h cross squared k prime squared over 2 m this is elastic scattering. Okay. And this is all we are going to consider just elastic scattering from a spherically symmetric potential then it is clear that infinitely far away there are going to be outgoing spherical waves. We are not going to answer the question of what is happening very close to the scattering origin here. That requires an exact solution of the problem. We are going to have to write the Schrodinger equation down and solve it. There is no getting away from it. That will tell you the full wave function at all points. But the assumption is very far away from the scattering center and we are going to look at only those potentials which die down sufficiently rapidly that this assumption is valid then the wave front the scattered wave has the form of spherical waves. Now, what would it look like asymptotically? This will go for long distances for very large distances r tending to infinity if you like. So, let me put that in brackets we got to make it more precise. It should have the form of spherical waves which are outgoing waves so that you can get into the detector right. Now, what does that look like? Since we are working in three dimensions, these outgoing waves must look like e to the i k r over r. Why is this so? Because now when I take a sphere and ask at any particular point here, what is the direction? This is the radius vector and what is the direction of the normal to the surface? It is like this, you are looking at the normal radial flux. So, you get e to the plus i k r over r because k and r point in the same direction, right? Okay. That is going to be the 1 over r dependence comes because the amplitude has to die down like 1 over r in three dimensions because the total amount of matter is conserved, right. Okay. But this cannot be all. It could be modulated by some fraction because I certainly do not expect the amplitude in this direction to be the same as in this direction or this or this or this. This is now going to be direction dependent. The r dependence is finished here asymptotically but it is got to have a modulating factor which is direction dependent. So, there would in general be some f of three, par three parameters. One parameter is that it would depend on the energy itself. After all, even classically this is true that if I shoot a very energetic particle, it will scatter less. I expect it to scatter less than a slow particle, right. So, therefore, this would be a function of the energy which I can call k instead of the energy let me just call it k equivalent completely equivalent. It would also be a function of theta and phi namely where are you with respect to this origin. 
But if this potential is spherically symmetrical, I do not expect any phi dependence because that dependence is this is completely spherically symmetrical. The spherical symmetry is broken by the incident direction because you have specified and singled out a particular direction namely the direction of the incident beam, but I still expect axial symmetry about that direction. So, I would still expect that the scattering here is the same as the scattering in all these at all these azimuthal angles, but of course, it would depend on the polar angle remember this is the polar axis. So, I do not ex expect any dependence here, but I ex for a central potential, but I expect a theta dependence. In particular, if theta is 0, there is scattering in this direction completely. If this were a hard sphere and you had classical particles, then of course, there would be nothing here, it would be in the shadow of this particle, but if these are waves, you would expect a diffraction to occur and therefore, you would expect an intensity, some non zero intensity. Yeah. As in should it be comparable to wavelength of the? We have taken point particles, we have taken point particles and this is a static potential. It is permeating everywhere in space. The only weak assumption being that sufficiently far for large values of r this potential should die down. And my only concern is for instance in double slit experiment, yes. the diffraction happens only when the wavelength is comparable to the slit width. The diffraction so always yeah. happens. Yeah. It is just that the pattern will change depending on what these are, but diffraction will always happen. Diffraction is another name for scattering. Yeah. That is precisely what we are going to do. We are going to now ask what is going to happen due to the potential acting everywhere. It is acting everywhere in space. So, even if this particle is if you like moving off like this, there is still an effect of this potential. right? So, it is not that this is a hard sphere and it has to make physical contact in order to hit it at all it is going to scatter no matter what. Yeah, we will we'll look at this I think. All I am saying is that there will be some amplitude even in the forward direction, just as there will be some amplitude in the backward direction also. So, theta equal to 0 corresponds to the forward direction and theta equal to pi is the backward direction and that is it. Theta is a polar angle runs from 0 to pi. So, I hope you agree that it is fair to assume that there is no phi dependence at all because of axial symmetry for a spherically symmetric potential, but there is definitely going to be a theta dependence. Hmm? So, we yeah. have to actually uh, take a superposition of all these frame units in the end to actually do a problem. Ah, now, depending on how you prepare the system, if I prepare this with a velocity selector and I say okay, I prepare it collimated about in such a way that there is essentially one in its incident momentum that is fine, but if I prepare it with a spread in momentum initial, then I have to do this problem for each incident state and then superpose the whole thing, certainly I have to do that. There is one more complication which I might as well mention here which you will see immediately what is happening. The incident plane wave is a momentum eigenstate, we have assumed it to be that, but momentum and angular momentum do not commute with each other in quantum mechanics because the angular momentum is r cross p and r and p do not commute with each other the same components do not. So, you have a little mismatch here. You have initially a momentum eigenstate, but you have a potential which is spherically symmetric and therefore, conserves <coughs> angular momentum. The trick then is to say okay, the way to do this is to take this momentum eigenstate and break it up into a superposition of angular momentum eigenstates and then look at the scattering of each of those separately and that is called phase shift analysis. We would not probably do that now, right now but we will see what happens. We will see now what this f of theta is going to do and all the information is going to be buried about the scattering is going to be buried in this f. So, you will permit me to say that this thing goes for large values of r and now let us even be precise about what is meant by large r because you, I just cannot say r tending to infinity. I have to say r large compared to what? Where is the natural length scale in this problem? V of r is something which I have not yet specified. So, there may be some length scales in that problem like it might die down exponentially with some characteristic length scale, but there is already a length scale in this problem and what is that? K, the incident wave vector gives me a number, a wave number gives me a length scale. So, K r much, much greater than 1. So, that is your condition here that r is much, much greater than K inverse. For this, 
the wave function will look like e to the i k dot r that is the incident wave nothing happens to it plus f of k comma theta e to the i k r over r. Okay. So, that is my boundary condition. I am going to look for those solutions of the Schrodinger equation which asymptotically behave like that as a superposition of the incident state and the scattered state and the scattered state corresponds to outgoing spherical waves with an amplitude which looks like uh, which is a function of the energy as well as the polar angle of scattering. Mm. Theta is called the angle of scattering and I want this as a function of theta so they are scattering in all directions okay. and this quantity here not surprisingly is called the scattering amplitude. And we will see immediately that it has a direct physical interpretation and is in fact a measurable quantity. Okay. This is not I emphasize again this is not the exact solution of the Schrodinger equation which we have not even written down yet. Hmm. But I am looking for that solution which asymptotically behaves in this fashion okay. that is my boundary condition here in the scattering problem. Now, let us see how we are going to get at this uh, quantity. First of all, let us look at the significance of this f. What I would like to do is what is the flux that means number of particles crossing per unit area per unit time. What is the flux scattered flux through through the surface through d s this surface element d s okay, divided by incident flux this will tell us what fraction of the incident flux is going through at a particular angle solid angle some given a, a small infinitesimal solid uh, cone of solid angle d omega at some particular point theta comma phi. This is equal to what is this equal to what would you define it as it is called the differential cross section how much of it is going through that particular cone. So, this is equal to d sigma by definition and d sigma divided by not d s but d omega is going to be called the differential cross section, but this is the quantity we want to compute. And now I want to show you that it is directly related to the scattering amplitude f as follows. First let us find the incident flux. Now the flux is given by the current j incident and as you know when you have the Schrodinger equation the current itself has an extremely simple formula for the current which is h cross over 2 m i psi star grad psi minus psi grad psi star. And in this case, we are looking at the incident. So, incident that is a standard formula in quantum mechanics. Is everyone familiar with this? Yes, it is easy to derive because all you have to do is to write the Schrodinger equation down and derive from it the equation of continuity. So, let us write the Schrodinger equation down, which is kinetic energy to start with i h cross delta psi over delta t equal to this is now the full Schrodinger equation time dependent Schrodinger equation i h cross delta psi over delta t is equal to the Hamiltonian acting on the wave function right. The Hamiltonian in this problem consists of h cross squared let us write this as i h cross whole squared over 2 m del squared that is the kinetic energy operator times psi plus v of r psi. This is the full Schrodinger equation for the time dependent wave function right. That immediately implies that its complex conjugate satisfies delta psi star over delta t equal to i h cross whole squared with a minus sign del square psi star plus v of r psi star. v of r is a real potential. The Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator. There could be cases where the potential becomes complex if for instance I have absorption or something like that you can model it with a complex potential. But here in this case probability is conserved 
completely there is no absorption of the incident flux at all. And from these two equations I multiply this by psi star, multiply this by psi and subtract one from the other and this immediately gives me i h cross delta over delta t mod psi squared. This is the probability density if you like is equal to i h cross whole squared over 2 m and then you have psi star del squared psi minus psi del squared psi star and this portion cancels out precisely because v of r is real. Had that been v star then of course this would not happen right. So this cancels out but you can write this as a gradient you can write this uh, del dot okay. So, you can write this as equal to. So, let us get rid of 1 ih cross this is equal to this. This is equal to minus del dot j and then it is a trivial matter to read off j to be just this because I take the del dot of this there is going to be a term which is precisely that and then there is going to be del psi star dot del psi and that cancels out on both sides. Okay. So, from that it follows that the current probability current is just given by this okay. But for the incident case what is this going to be equal to? Well psi incident is e to the i k dot r and the gradient of e to the i k dot r is i k dot e to the i k dot r. You are going to get a minus sign here and there is an extra minus sign here. So, there is going to be 2 times uh, i k the 2 i cancels and this gives you h cross k over m. which is what you expect because h cross k is the momentum for a classical particle for instance it is p over m this is what you expect would be the flux. So, this incident flux on this side in magnitude is h cross k over m. Now, we need the scattered flux up here okay and what flux are we looking for? We are looking for the one that goes normally to the surfaces of constant r. So, we are looking really for h cross over 2 m i. So, for the, for the scattered flux this is equal to and we are looking for the radial component. So, this is equal to psi scattered star delta psi scattered over delta r the radial component minus psi scattered times delta psi scattered star over delta r. That is the quantity we want to compute okay. This gives you the current the flux the radial flux and you have to multiply it by the area ds to give you the flux through ds and this is going to give you an r square d omega. So, if you have a solid angle a cone of solid angle d omega at a distance r then of course, the area is r squared d s uh, d s is just r squared d omega. Hmm. So, what is this equal to? We need to use this. I need to use this information for psi scattered. So, this gives me h cross over 2 m i times now, everywhere there is going to be this factor wherever psi star appears f is going to become f star because there is no reason why it should be real in general some complex number amplitude. So, you have to put an f star there and that is function of uh, function of angle alone does not get differentiated. So, it is clear that from this and that you are going to get a modulus of f of k theta whole squared times these quantities okay. So now let us write that down. This is equal to psi scattered is e to the minus i k r over r. That is this portion minus because the complex conjugated and then delta psi scattered over delta r is going to be i k e to the i k r over r that is the first part plus or rather minus e to the i k r over r squared that is the derivative of 1 over r with respect to r okay. Then the other term is minus e to the i k r over r that is this portion 
and then I have to differentiate e to the minus i k r over r with respect to r. So there is a minus i k e to the minus i k r over r and then minus e to the minus i k r over r squared. That is the full derivative out here and this is easy to simplify. This gives me h cross over 2 m i mod f squared and then the first terms add up. So there is a minus here and a minus here these two guys add up and therefore you get 2 i k this factor and that gives you unity divided by r squared and the second terms cancel. This is a minus 1 over r cube and there is a plus 1 over r cube. So that term cancels out and that is it. which now gives me h cross mod f square h cross k over m because the 2 cancels and then mod f squared over r square. So this thing gives me again h cross k over m and then mod f squared over r squared and then this area element is r squared d omega. So the incident flux completely cancels out. Now you can see that instead of e to the i k dot r if I had taken some amplitude a times e to the i k dot r there have been a factor mod a squared which would have cancelled out on top and below. This is equal to mod f squared so this immediately gives us a crucial formula which says the differential cross section d sigma divided by d omega that is the definition of the differential cross section this is equal to modulus of f of k theta. So the detector by measuring the flux is actually directly measuring the modulus square of the scattering amplitude. Okay. So the job is now to compute this quantity for a given potential and then compare it with what you see on observation. 